Tonight on Gangs of Oz, the incredible story of the Italian Mafia, right here in Australia. I was amazed back then how organised they were. Our ex-undercover cop takes us into the grubby world of Mafia gangs. How they ruled with corruption and fear and ordered ruthless violence, murder, extortion. A parcel bomb delivered to the office exploded near two men. All to protect their lucrative drug rackets. It was amazing. It actually disappeared into the heat wave on the horizon. That's how large it was. Take your clothes off, mate. And the extraordinary lengths this undercover cop had to go to in order to keep his cover. Take your fucking not, clothes off. Not taking my clothes From off. From nude drug deals to prostitution, for six years, Damien Marrett gave the performance of his life. After dealing with the Italians for the last three or four months, it was obvious that I had no reason not to enjoy a prostitute. It's a deadly world where the violence continues even after death. Australia has its own homegrown version of the Mafia. Its roots are from Italy's poor south, the region of Calabria. Oh, shut up, you In Australia, its power grew after World War II when thousands of Italian migrants, some with Mafia connections, made their way to Australia. The Calabrians have been involved in criminal activity spanning uh, cannabis production, heroin, cocaine, ecstasy, hashish importation, insurance frauds, other types of frauds. Uh, through to money laundering, to uh, passport offences. With all organised crime, there is a hierarchy, a leader. With the Mafia, it's a godfather. There are people who would be identified as godfathers, but they don't, in fact, uh, rule the organisation as they do in Italy. Uh, they are more uh, of a uh, father figure from whom people seek counsel and or get advice. Back in the 60s, the Australian Mafia had its roots here, at Melbourne's Queen Victoria Markets. Sellers paid the Mafia a cut to have their produce sold, and wholesalers paid a levy to buy the produce at a particular price. In money terms, they were among the most lucrative uh, returns in those days, compared with, say, backstreet gambling in Victoria, or small-time brothels. It was very lucrative, and it made the then Mafia, uh, very powerful in Victorian terms. Because of the money involved, there was a continual battle for control, often ending in death. The first to go was this man, Calabrian-born Vincenzo Angeletti. He was blasted to death on April 4, 1963. Then on January 16, 1964, Calabrian-born Vincenzo Muratori assassinated. Payback for the first shooting of Angeletti. These shootings shook up Menzies era Australia. It was clear to everyone the Mafia had arrived. To the government and the law, this is the first step on a one-way road to ruin. But in the well-locked rooms where the pot smokers gather, there is no debate on the rights or wrongs. Fast forward a decade later, when marijuana became the drug of the 70s, the Mafia seized an opportunity to make megabucks. It was really easy. They had the connections of the fruit growers that supplied the markets, and pretty soon they were growing more than just fruit. By the early 70s, the Mafia was making millions from their marijuana crops around Griffith in country New South Wales. People in Griffith were showing unexplained wealth. There was houses. Uh, being built down there, referred to as grass castles. The rumours were that there was a lot of marijuana grown in the area and that uh, certain uh, groups or families were involved in it. The open display of obvious criminal wealth was too much for Griffith Furniture Store owner and local aspiring Liberal politician, Donald Mackay. Mackay was determined to stop the rot in his town, so he took matters into his own hands, gathering information and passing it on to the police. Myself and my colleagues went and interviewed uh, Don McKay uh, at his furniture shop in Griffith. 
and he told us about this particular property at Collie Amberley and he drew, he drew us a mud map, if you like. Armed with a mud map, the cops went to check it out. Back in 1975, Mick Drury was a young drug squad cop. There was the local police officer in the paddy wagon with two other detectives from the drug squad in Sydney. Me being the junior police officer, I was on the motorbike in the front. As I was approaching the property, I could see a number of males running out into the bushland. And I grabbed a white Holden Ute that was a farm vehicle. And Glenn Ross jumped in the vehicle with me. When we arrived at the plantation, two of the offenders obviously thought that it was a friendly car approaching. One we arrested. And one probably about 200 metres over to my left. Hey, let him go! Who came out with a shotgun in his hand. At that stage, the uniform officer, Bobby Houtson, pulled a rifle out of the paddy wagon. Stop it! Stop the gun! Fired it well and truly into the sky above the offender's head. Drop it now! Put the gun down! Put the gun down! Put it down now! Get your hands up. Sit. Okay. I see the cut. I see the cut. Spread your legs. Spread your legs. There was a huge amount of marijuana growing there. I'd never seen anything like it. I'd seen marijuana crops up to five acres previous to this, but I'd never seen anything like this in my life. It was amazing. It actually disappeared into the heat wave on the horizon. That's how large it was. The find shocked Griffith. For Don McKay, it was a victory. For the Mafia, it was millions up in smoke. It got to the stage where uh, I think Don was ready to start naming the people in the big Collie drug bust, because the police weren't able to uh, convict anyone of that big bust. Donald McKay, the heroic family man who decided to take on the Mafia, didn't get his chance to name names. On July 15, 1977, Donald McKay's car was found in this pub car park. He had left his furniture store for a quick beer after work. Police found three bullet cases, his keys and a pool of blood. His body was nowhere to be seen and to this day has never been found. He had obviously been murdered and disposed of by an organised crime group. It was historic. I don't think anything like that had ever happened in Australian history, and I think probably Australia grew up a little bit that day. When the police first came to see me, I just knew straight away when they told me what they'd found that Don had gone. I know that many people in high places say publicly there is no such thing as organised crime and corruption in New South Wales. Now, if they think that that's what the ordinary people in the street believe, they're right out of touch. Two years after the disappearance of Donald McKay, the town of Griffith was turned upside down when the Woodward Royal Commission was set up to investigate drug trafficking and McKay's murder. The report named Francesco Sergi, Dominic Sergi, Antonio Sergi from the winery, Francesco Barbaro, and Robert Trimboli as the men who ordered the hit on Donald McKay. No charges were ever laid. Attempts from the press to interview some of those named were met with hostility. We're looking for Dominic. Yeah, hi Dominic. Dominic Sergi? Yeah, how do you want? You're the one that was in the Royal Commission. Put it in my sin there, all right? No. Put it in my sin there, all right? I'll put it in the car. Stop! I'm not putting it in the car. Why won't you answer me? Shut up! Stop! It was ten years after the assassination of Don McKay before James Baisley was convicted of conspiring to murder him.
But true to the Mafia code of silence, Baisley told the police nothing. He served 15 years. Also named in the Woodward Royal Commission, but never put away, was Robert Trimboli. He fled to Ireland. As attempts were made to extradite him back to Australia to face charges in 1987, Trimboli turned up dead in Spain. He was brought back to Australia for burial. Well, not now, what? Uh, Let's get it away, all right? Trimboli's funeral in Sydney is best remembered for the absurd punch-up between members of the family and the media. Coming up, for undercover cop Damien Marrett, <laughs> an unwelcome surprise. The Mafia sends a deadly message that shocks the nation. And a recent massive ecstasy hall confirms the next generation of Mafia is still taking care of business. In the late 80s, marijuana took a back seat as the demand for designer drugs such as ecstasy and cocaine took over. The Mafia muscled in, making hundreds of millions of dollars. Police were desperate to stop the influx of drugs onto the streets, so they started recruiting undercover officers to infiltrate the Mafia and get convictable evidence. One of those chosen was young Melbourne cop Damien Marrett. I joined the police force in the uh, start of 87. In all, I spent 16 years in the police force. So six of those years, or just over six of those years, was undercover. It's harder than what it sounds. You know, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, I'd like to go out and pretend I'm somebody else and chat. But it's when you've got to remember all the lies that you've been speaking over the last six months and sustain that life uh, where it just becomes exhausting. Exhausting and addictive. When you do your first job and you get it to the point where some good crooks are, are busted, you're, you're basically on a high and you end up trying to chase that high throughout the rest of your undercover, you know, career. Like all undercover cops, Damien always had to think on his feet, even under the most bizarre circumstances. One drug deal that I had organised down in Victoria for a large amount of uh, LSD and ecstasy, I was uh, going to travel to Sydney, meet this uh, crook's connections, pay 230 grand and receive all the drugs. Being undercover sometimes meant wearing a recording device strapped to his body. And knowing discovery meant certain death, bulky equipment just compounded the risks. There was a little bit of... Um, rivalry between Sydney police and Victorian police and the devices that uh, they made me wear were larger than ours and obviously old old stock <laughs> and uh, so I was covered in wires and devices. I knock on the door and there's four crooks inside. When I got in there everyone was naked. Damien, my friend, come on in and I basically got a bit of a shock. <laughs> they tell me to take my clothes off. And obviously I can't with the devices. Mate, it's a hot day. Take your clothes off. Feel free. Why? All right, boys. All right, comfortable. Or are you pulls or something? No, mate. Have you got something to hide? No, mate. What's going on? And I'm trying to grip onto anything to get out of this and, uh, you know, calling them faggots and, you know, we do things different in... I was actually from Perth, my cover story. Uh, you know, Perth boys don't take their clothes off for you Sydney gays. What have you got under there? What are you hiding? I've got nothing under there. What are you hiding? Up? All over the lot, don't I? Come here, little fucking truck, you, you Take your clothes off and show us. 
No, put your clothes back on, mate. I'm not a fucking wolf. Take no, your fucking not, clothes off. Not, not. It got uh, angrier and angrier, and I, I knew it was on the verge of uh, fisty cuffs and, um, or, you know, pulling out weapons. I don't know where they were going to pull their weapons out from. Take your fucking clothes off. No, fine. I'll fucking talk to you. This is fucking shit. I got down to the bottom, I ripped off the devices and gave them a call and said, listen, the, the reason why I didn't want to get undressed, we all said no guns, I had a gun, uh, I'm willing to come back up and get naked. But the crooks didn't go for it. This was one of the many lucky escapes for Damien. While Damien continued his path to infiltrate the Mafia, around the country police were finding huge dope crops among the grapes of Griffith, out the back of Burke and up near Townsville. This was a problem that had to be fought on a national level. So the government formed a national crime authority known as the NCA. In the 90s, of course, the NCA was primarily focused on two or three organised crime groups, one of which was the Calabrians. And it was a national investigation in Adelaide, together with the South Australian Police. Uh, they were targeting individuals who they thought were participating in uh, criminal activity. One senior Mafia investigator working for the NCA at the time was Detective Geoffrey Bowen. He was about to be the key witness for the prosecution in an upcoming trial. The day before the trial, the Mafia sent a clear message. On the 2nd of March, 1994, Detective Bowen received a parcel. It was marked as sent from IBM. Security checked the scanner was working, then proceeded to scan the unexpected parcel. It came up clear. It wasn't a terribly sophisticated bomb. Charges were placed inside a parcel with the uh, triggering mechanism focused on the lid. As Geoffrey Bowen went back to his office to open the parcel, he ironically joked that it might be a bomb. Not be a bomb. <laughs> Once the lid was open on the parcel, triggered the explosion. The blast tore apart the NCA office on the top floor of a city building. The street below was showered with glass as windows blew out. Amazingly, no injuries to pedestrians. There's a huge shower of glass and then all paper was falling down and smoke billowing out and then some vertical blinds were falling down and it was just a mess everywhere. Police say a parcel bomb delivered to the office exploded near two men. One was killed, the second was seriously injured. The dead man was Detective Sergeant Geoffrey Bowen, a 36-year-old Western Australian detective on secondment to the NCA. He leaves behind a wife and two young children. This letter bomb was a targeted assassination on a police officer whose upcoming testimony threatened senior Mafia figures. It shows the mentality of the Italian group that they put themselves on such a ped pedestal that nobody's allowed to touch them. And, you know, sorry, but that's not how it works. So, um, you know, it, it's sad. Geoffrey Bowen was a great detective and beautiful family and lost his life just simply because he was trying to uphold the law. Adelaide Court this morning. Let's come out. Bowen's assassination had an immediate impact on the trial. This court case was adjourned. Federal prosecutors told the court the trial couldn't go ahead because of Detective Jeff Bowen's death. Oh, shut up, you Although the police don't doubt the Calabrian Mafia was responsible for the bombing, no one has ever been convicted of Geoffrey Bowen's murder. But it galvanised law enforcement around the country. Traditionally in Australia, the criminal networks have primarily used corruption as the tool to influence law enforcement. But to be actually attacked in that way was something totally unexpected. But it also energised the various organised crime investigation groups around the country. Next, Damien Merritt wins the trust of the Mafia's inner circle and the incredible secret footage of a huge drug operation in flight. And for Damien, partying with the big boys was a do-or-die performance.
There was no warning for the National Crime Authority's detective sergeant. He's believed to have triggered the massive explosion simply by opening a package addressed to him. This assassination of a police officer shocked the nation. But it was not so surprising to the people of Mildura, a country town in Victoria, famous for its grapes and oranges and its decades of mafia-related crime. Police found 6,000 marijuana plants growing on a property belonging to this man, Mildura grape grower Pascali Kafari. The marijuana had a street value of about $20 million. Marijuana was like gold, only easier to produce. The mafia quickly eliminated anyone standing in the way of their riches. Marco Medici shot dead. His killer is never found. A year later, brothers-in-law Rocco Medici and Giuseppe Furina are tortured and shot to death. Mildura greengrocer Dominic Marafiotti is killed and buried under a chicken shed there. His parents are also found murdered. In August 1988, Giuseppe Arena is shot dead, execution style. He was known to police as the washing machine, the man who laundered money for criminals based in Mildura. In June 1992, Mildura was the target of a massive undercover police operation to bust up a huge Mafia drug ring. At the centre of it all was Mafia heavy Matteo Medici. Damien had built up a drug dealing relationship with Medici, gradually gaining his trust and increasing the size of the deals. Finally, he was ready for the big order. We'd set it up for 50 pounds of cannabis and 50 pounds of amphetamines to be supplied by Medici for the sum of uh, one million and sixty-five thousand dollars. And naturally, it had to be in cash. We had the million dollars in a big green toolbox. You know, we bought it in for the show, to show that we had the money there in Mildura. No one had ever asked for this much cash. The money actually came out of the police budget, and the money had to be back in the police budget by the following Monday, or coppers wouldn't get paid their overtime. So. It sort of added a, another dimension to the job. We met them at a park and we brought with us a dog trailer. And supposedly the Italians were going to load up the back of that dog trailer with all the drugs, take the money and leave. This is the actual police surveillance footage from that day. You can see Damien there in the baseball cap. Everything was playing out perfectly when unexpectedly the plan went haywire. I was uh, briefed beforehand, if you hear any shots, hit the ground because it means we're coming out firing. Something's, you know, been seen or, or whatever. Um, and, and what happened was, it was a mistake by a very good SAG member and a good friend of mine, but uh, he's jumped out of the van and accidentally let a shot off as he's hit the ground. Everyone hit the deck. You can see Medici throw his gun. On the video, you see Meducci sort of run towards the riverbank and throw his pistol into the, the water. At this point, the police special operations group arrested everyone, including Damien. But only a few of the police knew that Damien was one of them and undercover. There was a real uh, hatred from the coppers towards Meducci and his dealings, so they were ready to come into the room and give me uh, a going over. and. Uh, you know, luckily, people on my side sort of came and said, oh, look, I'll handle this defendant. The operation was a huge success, especially for Damien. Medici was sentenced to eight years in jail. <laughs> Damien continued his dangerous foray undercover. This is the actual surveillance footage of Damien counting $180,000 to buy cocaine from a man who would kill him if he knew there was a camera. Damien had made it to the inner circle and was recording it all. As an undercover, that is great evidence because, uh, you know, counting out money, for what other reason would we be counting out $180,000? Uh, and there was also conversations about the drugs that we were going to purchase, the cocaine, how that was going to work, uh, how we'd drive the cars and so forth. So, you know, it, it's just great evidence that uh, you just can't beat. So. 
you know you just make sure that as an undercover you're positioned in that camera lens and you know you can see the money and the conversation is about drugs basically once the tapes are delivered to the defense it rarely goes to trial because it's all there you know so might as well put your hand up and do your time the man on the right of the couch is Ross Trimboli, a senior figure in the Griffith Mafia. He was the target of the biggest undercover operation ever staged in Australia, called Operation Afghan. Damien was in place. Operation Afghan was commenced in uh, 1993, and it was as a result of a, uh, a question that was posed by the NCA at that time. Um, one, is there a uh, mafia? And two, to what extent um, are they involved in organised crime in Australia? Cheers. Happy birthday, Mickey. Thank you. Thank you. Like most of the major uh, criminal identities, Ross lived that same lifestyle of throwing his money around. He would spend more money in one night out than a poor copper would earn in a month. Mafia blood runs deep. Ross's uncle was Bob Trimboli, one of the men named in the Woodward Royal Commission as ordering the murder of Donald McKay. He carried on his uncle's business and was a senior mafia figure in Griffith. At the time, we checked his tax statements, and you know, for an orange farmer, he was earning you know twenty or thirty thousand a year, uh, and you know he could spend that in a in a month easy. You know, um, he could spend ten grand in a day if he wanted to. So he had a lot of money that was uh, there to sort of move on, and he lived that lifestyle. Now, whether it was drinking, whether it was um, cocaine, whether it was uh, high-class prostitutes. Above Ross Trimboli was Tony Romeo. He married into the mob. These men were hardcore mafia heavies. Damien Marrett had muscled in and now was one of them. The Mafia of Griffith had no idea just how close Damien was to bringing them down. Coming up, a lunch invitation Damien Merritt couldn't refuse. And inside the biggest undercover operation ever staged in Australia. After months of lies and deception, undercover cop Damien Marrett had managed to get on the inside of one of the country's biggest mafia rings. Every minute of his day, he was in constant danger. To survive, he had to live the life the mafia did. <laughs> on one of the occasions that uh, we travelled to Griffith, we knew a week ahead that the Italians were going to put on a bit of a party for us. They had mentioned that they were going to get some, some girls for us, mainly prostitutes. And there was a large amount of cocaine at that party. You've got to remember that we're portraying ourselves to be a certain type of person and not to go down that track would become quite obvious that something just wasn't right. If I had the choice, I would have said no to, you know, going into a bedroom with this uh, prostitute. But after dealing with these, uh, the Italians for you know, the last three or four months, it was obvious that uh, I had no reason not to, to enjoy a, a prostitute and uh, quite a good looking girl, young, all the rest of it. So how do I then turn around and say, no, you know, am I, uh, am I gay? Um, is there some reason? Obviously I didn't portray myself as being gay. So I had to go through with it and I found it a bit uh, unnerving because if, if I decided to, to go out and pay for the services of, a, of one of these girls, fine. But it wasn't my decision, it was more that I had to do it because of the role that I was playing and I also knew it was another test that I had to pass and I also knew that um, she would be asking certain questions along the way. Um, you know, just checking up on my background for the Italians. Ah. Mm. So, you know, even though it passed the test with flying colours, um, you know, and answered the questions and, and so forth, it was something that didn't sit well with me at the time, but uh, I still to this day can't see any other way of, uh, you know, changing that situation.
After months of doing the hard yards as one of Ross Trimboli and Tony Romeo's drug buyers, Damien thought he had their trust, but his cover was never totally safe. There was just something in the air up at Griffith that wasn't right. Um, we didn't know exactly what it was. We'd received further intelligence from the NCA that uh, somebody high up in the Italian group had been paying off a, um, a uh, high up tax official, a uh, politician and a copper, uh, 100 grand a year for information. Now, we didn't know whether that information may have leaked through about ourselves. And when an invitation to have lunch with some of the mob took a strange turn, Damien thought his cover may have been blown. We pull up at uh, his farmhouse and uh, he says, uh, have you got anything on you? And he frisks me. I couldn't wear uh, devices in that job anyway because we didn't have backup. Backup was two hours away because people would see who's coming into the town and so forth. You know, I was unnerved at this stage. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, he says, I want to show you something. And we walked through the narrows of an orange grove. And, you know, my brain was clicking over. Uh, am I in trouble here? Automatically, you think of the old mafia movies, you know, um, here I go. We get to the end and he basically uh, tells me to kneel down. I knelt down and in my mind I'm thinking, am I right or wrong? One, I don't want to stuff up this job, we've all done too much work. And two, if I am wrong, I mean, what can I do anyway? You know, I don't, I'm not armed. Um, you know, the minute I took off, <laughs> it's just a matter of uh, pulling a trigger, so... Basically, he tells me to look into the bushes, so I'm not only kneeling down, but I'm sort of crouching my head down, and there was nothing there. And that's when I thought, well, this is where he's going to do it. He's, I'm, I'm gone, you know, and you hear all the stories about other people that have just disappeared, you know, um, in relation to this group. And, um, you know, I said, mate, and he says, in further. corner of my eye I caught a garbage bag that was hidden in the bushes and it turned out that it was the cannabis that we'd ordered 12 pound of cannabis that's why he took me there but you know whether he wanted to see how I reacted whether he wanted to show that uh, he was in charge um, you know things could happen that easily whether he wanted to see whether um, you know black pajama men jump out of bushes who knows but uh, it did unsettle me but um, you know thank god it uh, wasn't the way that I thought next the mob takes care of its own Australia's biggest ecstasy bust puts Griffith back in the headlines we don't know where he is buried and one man's courage although there are people alive today in this community who most certainly do in the name of his father undercover cop damien marrett had successfully infiltrated one of the country's biggest calabrian mafia rings headed up by ross trimboli and tony romeo after 18 months of intense planning it was now time for Operation Afghan to strike. Right throughout the job, we were setting up to purchase a ton of cannabis coming from Papua New Guinea. So it was going to um, be transferred from Papua New Guinea to Horn Island and then flown down to uh, New South Wales, um, Kahuna Airport. We hired a uh, Cessna. We took Ross Trimboli, the pilot from New Guinea, and a man. This is the actual surveillance footage from the Cessna. Captured by a pin-sized camera, the police had hidden in a gap in the plane's interior panels. How was your trip? Here you can see Damien greeting Ross Trimboli. This flight was a dummy run to see how much they could carry. 
We all went up just to make sure that we knew exactly how this was going to work. We landed on Horn Island. We spoke about how quick we could load the cannabis into the plane, how much the plane could hold. So the maximum amount has got to be uh, 750 kilo. I know we probably can not get a tonne, but absolute maximum 750. This training run we did, we just tested it out, because this, this is the plane. We will pull all the seats out, all the cargo, hold will be empty. And we just can't do any more than 750, all right? Unless we've got a trailer on the back. <laughs> Damien was dealing well with the intense pressure of being undercover, but this plane trip would push him to the limit. Any friendliness that I had towards Trimboli stopped on that aeroplane when uh, the conversation was led on to the NCA bombing in Adelaide. It was still very raw to coppers that somebody had killed a copper, especially by parcel bomb. When Ross started talking about the NCA, it was very flippant, and the way he, he spoke about what happened, his words were, he messed with our family, he was very hard on our family, we had to do it, fuck him. Everything just stopped for me. I wanted to strangle this bloke, and the hatred that I had for him at that time, I could not mask, and I had to turn away, look out a window or whatever. He was talking about a decent copper who had been killed um, simply for doing his job. But knowing what was at stake, Damien kept his cover. After a successful dummy run, they set off to Horn Island to pick up almost a ton of cannabis. The police made the call. The nationwide raids and arrests followed the interception of a light aircraft on Horn Island in northern Queensland with 750 kilograms of marijuana worth an estimated $6 million was expected to be seized. It was not on the plane, but police launched the nationwide raids, claiming the conspiracy was well established over many months with recent seizures of cocaine and marijuana. 257 police raided 17 homes and businesses. Tony Romeo was charged with conspiracy to traffic drugs and conspiracy to import drugs. Ross Trimboli was charged with drug trafficking and conspiring to import drugs. They were each sentenced to 10 years jail. Six others got sentences of three or four years. To arrest figures like uh, Romeo, Trimboli and all the others and the, the soldiers, the Italian soldiers uh, on the streets of uh, Griffith it was a, a huge thing for that town to see that happen. Tony Romeo was released from jail in May 2002 after serving just six years of his 10 year sentence. His release was not welcomed by all. Six weeks after Tony Romeo's release from jail, he was shot dead. In true mafia style, no one saw anything and no motive ever confirmed. One theory is that it was in retaliation for an affair that he was having with a, another Italian figure's wife. The second theory was that uh, it was the embarrassment that he had brought on the, uh, the families up there for accepting undercovers into the group and just general stuff that came out at trial. And the third one was he had actually been given information to police during his time in jail. As the older Mafia members disappeared, the new generation stepped up. They're far more entrepreneurial. They're far more flamboyant. They spend their wealth visibly, and perhaps that ultimately will make them uh, vulnerable. Police had been waiting more than a year, and this morning they swooped. On August the 8th, 2008, the luck ran out for one massive syndicate, alleged to have Griffith Mafia connections. 15 million pills with a street value of almost half a billion dollars, 
carefully hidden inside 10 tomatoes shipped from Italy to Melbourne. Each of these pills cost 75 cents to manufacture in Europe. Here they wholesale for $14 and then sell on the street for over $30. This syndicate is alleged to be involved in something in the order of 60% of importations coming into Southeast Australia. Next, 30 years on, Donald McKay remembered. A township forever branded as a mafia stronghold. We didn't realise that we still had such element in the community. And for Damien Marrett, a most unlikely ending. Police had been waiting more than a year, and this morning they swooped. 15 million pills with a street value of almost half a billion dollars, carefully hidden inside 10 tomatoes shipped from Italy to Melbourne. This recent ecstasy haul is a huge win for police in the fight against mafia crime gangs. But definitely not a win for the people of Griffith. I think that shook Griffith even more so than when Don disappeared. The fact that Griffith could be housing some of the principals in such a huge deal made people wake up and say, well, we didn't realise that we still had such element in the community. We would like to thank the Griffith Rotary Club for proposing this memorial and seeing it through. On the 10th of October, 2008, 31 years after the disappearance of Griffith Furniture Store owner Donald McKay, he was honoured when this statue of him was unveiled. Our father was never given the opportunity to see his youngest child start school, the opportunity to see any of his children get married. He wasn't even allowed to rest in peace. We don't know where he is buried, although there are people alive today in this community who most certainly do. In 1979, the Woodward Royal Commission named Francesco Sergi, Dominic Sergi, Antonio Sergi, Francesco Barbaro, Robert Trimboli and Antonio Sergi from the winery as the persons responsible for ordering the murder of our father. 31 years later, these individuals have still not fa faced any charges in relation to this crime. Some might say they got away with murder. All bar one of them is still alive, and I believe they all still live in our community. Um, yeah, that hurts. Uh, it, uh, it hurts when I run into them uh, just uh, socially at, at uh, various things, and uh, it's a little bit hard to take sometimes, yeah. The Mafia activities based in Griffith blackened the reputation of a whole town, particularly hundreds of families with Italian names. I believe that there's a group of criminals amongst a few families in Griffith. Uh, I don't think the, uh, it's widespread throughout the community. Uh, unfortunately, those individuals uh, do wield some influence within their community. The greatest tragedy, I think, is uh, that there's so many people with the sa same surnames as these people, and they, it's, it's a great shame that they get tarred with a brush that they shouldn't be tarred with, I th and I think that's a tragedy. Damien Marritt spent five days in the witness box helping to bust the Griffith Mafia. He has since left the force, but the scars remain. Over the six years, uh, I knew that I was having um, certain problems in certain areas, but it wasn't until I left the undercover um, squad that I realised I did have some pretty big issues, um, some carryover from all that time, whether it be paranoia, uh, aloofness, uh, secretive, um, I wanted to work by myself all the time, uh, things like that. It, it took a fair while to get over that time in my life. Damien has since gone on to become a successful author. Those arrested for the huge ecstasy hall are awaiting trial in Melbourne. The fight against mafia criminal activity in Australia continues on both a state and national level.